Hi everybody, welcome back to my attempt to get you a whole bunch of information while I'm out sick. Well, broken, I guess, more than sick. Um, we're gonna pick up today where we left off. So when we left off yesterday, we had just finished talking about the storming of the Bastille, which by the way, after it was stormed by the fall of that year, they had actually started to take the actual prison apart. Like it was a big symbolic thing. People sort of stormed the building itself and were taking it down brick by brick. And that place would become uh, kind of an important commemorative place. Um, we'll talk more about that in the future. But I wanted to talk about what our objectives for today are, and then we'll get into the info. So we're going to be talking a lot about women today and what their place was, as well as other marginalized groups, and how they reacted to this idea and this claim that all men were created equal, right? Which is one of the basis major ideas of the French Revolution. And then I want you to just think about how's the revolution doing so far? And that will be an ongoing question. Like how is, how are things going? Is it successful? Is everyone getting their voice heard and so on? And then those are the terms that we'll be going over today. So we left off on July 14, 1789 with what started as kind of a gentle protest for um, more of a say in the governing of the country by the Third Estate and ended up with someone's head on a pike at the Bastille as um, the revolutionaries looked for weapons. And today's going to get a little bit crazy again. You saw a, a preview of this if you watched um, the film Marie Antoinette. So, oops, other way, other way, other way. Um, so now what, right? They've stormed the Bastille, they've got some weapons. Well, now basically what happens is chaos. So there's a little bit of panic, especially in the countryside. And I want you to remember that um, France is sometimes called Paris to end the rest. Paris is a much more radical place than the rest of Paris at this point. Um, the countryside sees itself as pretty separate from what's going on in Paris. Um, but they're obviously affected by what's happening in Paris. So the great fear begins in July. So July 17th, just a few days after the storming of the Bastille and goes on to about August 3rd. It's a peasants revolt. There were rumors that the nobles were going to start seizing grain. And remember, that's kind of at the root of a lot of this. And that will be really important today when people are hungry. I picture them as hangry, right? Like they're hangry. And think about the desperation that this means. This means people can't feed their kids. They can't feed themselves. They have no money. They have nowhere to turn. And so food is really at the center of a lot of this. And I think you'll see this throughout history a lot. When you have famines, it's often going to lead to political unrest. Um, so these rumors that the nobles are going to start seizing the grain, the peasants just decide to attack first. So they start attacking a lot of manor houses. Um, seizing grain for themselves, and this is going to lead to kind of chaos and unrest and destruction in the Parisian countryside. So that's going to bring the countryside into the revolution. <clears throat> and I want you to still think about, can we talk about this as a cause of the revolution? Like I said last time that July 14th is really a turning point. It's turned violent. Is this still a cause of the revolution? Like, do you think the revolution is well underway by this point? Or do you think that um, this is this is like the revolution still kind of getting going? I just need you to think about these things and how you would write about that in an essay because it really does matter. You can't talk about something, you know, we're talking 1789 right now and really within a couple of weeks of Bastille Day. But when you start talking about 1795, that's not a cause of the revolution anymore. That's like well underway, right? So just think about your timeline there. Is this still part of the spark? Or is this the fire intensifying? Like, how would you talk about this? So, ah, I keep going backwards. There we go. Okay. Um, so the first thing that the National Assembly starts doing now that they've got some weapons and have secured their right to exist um, is legislating. They start passing a bunch of decrees. The three main goals of the revolution are quickly laid out. And that's liberté, égalité, fraternité. I, by the way, I don't actually speak French. I've just learned to fake it over the years. I took a course on reading French in grad school, but I'm mostly faking it. So if I say that wrong and you know better, you go with your way. I do think it's worth learning this in French because it's pretty easy. Um, but it just translates to liberty, equality, 
and fraternity. So think about what those three terms mean. I think that there are words that you understand, except for maybe fraternity. Fraternity um, is kind of that Rousseauian sense of the general will or brotherhood, right? And it, it's the same word that uh, fraternity comes from, like frats, like in college. So I think that that can help you remember that frat brothers, fraternity, um, same word. <clears throat> Okay, so just to give you an idea of how important this is, you see these words all over Paris. This is the French Supreme Court, Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité. This is um, the Hotel de Ville or the Parisian City Hall. There's kind of a close-up of it there. You see Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité. I just was snapping pictures of this as I was going around Paris this summer. This is the Sorbonne, the School of Law, um, Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité. So obviously this is a thing, right? And actually President Obama gave a speech when there was a terrorist attack in Paris a few years ago and, and cited this, like, we're with you, we believe in these same ideas of your revolution, Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité. Like saying it in French is something that people do um, and it's something that people know. So the August decrees, ah, uh, are passed um, between, it's 19 decrees actually passed between August 4th and 11th, and they do some pretty big things considering that the revolution is just kind of underway. Um, you can see it in the picture here, memorialized in this plaque on a, a pillar in the Plaza of the Republic in Paris. Um, first of all, it ended feudalism. Now this was a huge sweeping change, and there's a lot of debate amongst historians over whether feudalism still wholly existed at this time, whether they were passing something that really already had basically ended in practice or whether this was big sweeping reform. It sort of depends on who you ask and how they inter interpret things. They abolished tithes. So um, all Frenchmen were expected to give about 10% of their income to the church, which was a great source of wealth for the church. So this is really meant to, um, to take that privilege away from the church. They made all Frenchmen equal under the law and eligible for the same jobs. Now that was a really big deal. Abby C.A., for instance, who we talked about last time, had been denied access to certain um, positions within the church because he hadn't been born a noble. Um, even though he was talented and smart and all of that, it didn't matter. He didn't have a title, and therefore he wasn't allowed to move up in, uh, move up in the ranks. And then it also provided freedom of worship, which is a really big deal if we think about all of the um, religious wars that we talked about just briefly in class. Um, this is, this is an enlightened despot idea, right? To have freedom of worship and freedom of religion. It still really is benefiting the bourgeoisie. There's a reason we call this the moderate or the bourgeois phase of the revolution. Um, there's still feudal dues. So even though feudalism might technically end and you're not technically a serf anymore, you still have to pay uh, your landlord for the right of living on that land. Um, and a lot of historians still debate the impact of this. You know, is this really sweeping reform or is this so poorly executed that it, it actually hindered real reform? Um, and again, that is one of those questions that you really have to dig into the text, dig into the archives to answer. And sometimes historians have different interpretations of that. Oop, I'm going backwards again. Okay, um, the next thing that was passed was the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. Um, this was adopted on August 26, 1789, written by Abby C.A. So again, he's playing a pretty big role, right? And he's one of the few people that we're going to see survive the whole revolution, not to like spoil things for you, but the revolution is going to get pretty violent pretty quickly. Um, he'll actually survive until after the revolution. Um, and the Marquis de Lafayette, if you are uh, pretty up on your American history, you might remember that he fought in the American Revolution and helped the Americans um, win the Battle of Yorktown, basically. They also consulted with Thomas Jefferson. They're really kind of drawing on um, the Declaration of Independence. So unlike the Declaration of Independence, this is more kind of putting into... Uh, into words that the major ideas of the revolution, whereas the Declaration of Independence is doing that and saying we're breaking away from England, right? So they're similar, but not quite the same. Um, you're going to read this uh, later, so I won't get too much into the details, but basically it says it's talking all about natural rights, like everyone is equal under the law. This and several other documents are the basis of the 1948 UN Declaration of Human Rights, so it's really an important founding document. 
but it left some questions unanswered. So first off, what about women? Is, this, is a woman a citizen or are only men citizens? Because they use the word citizen, but they don't really clarify. What about slavery? If all men are created equal, does that mean slaves can't exist? What about free blacks in the colonies? Are they considered under that, that phrase, all men? Um, they're really grappling with ideas of citizenship here. And a lot of these groups are going to uh, create petitions to the National Assembly explaining why citizenship should apply to them. And then if you're talking about freedom of religion, it was one thing in France to say, okay, well, the Calvinists and different um, uh, Re Reformation Christianities can practice as well as Catholicism. is a whole other thing to say that Jews would have freedom of worship. So these unresolved questions are going to lead to lots of new proposals. We're going to see independence movements. We're going to see revolts. We're going to see a lot of upheaval because these questions are, are not addressed. Um, so one of the ones that we'll look at later is the Declaration of the Rights of Women, which Olympe de Gouges will write a couple of years later. Um, we'll also look at the Haitian independence movement led by Toussaint L'Ouverture, um, which is one of the only successful slave, results, slave revolts in, um, in world history. And along with all of these questions, they're also creating a real revolutionary culture. So, for instance, um, there were not quite yet, but eventually would be proposals that maybe there should be like a national costume. And they actually hired David, the guy who painted the uh, tennis court oath, um, to design a national costume. It was never wholly put into effect, but some of these did carry over. So the liberty cap here is this red hat. Um, the cockade is that little ribbon thing there. Um, these became standard wear. If you wanted to show how excited you were for the revolution, how much you supported it, which eventually would become really literally a question of life and death, um, this is something you wouldn't leave the house without. Um, the new flag is created, so it's flown all over the place, and you see these colors used in the cockade. Those were colors that had meaning to the French. They were symbolic of Paris and the Bourbons and so on. It meant to simplify kind of bringing all those things together. There's medals that are put out. This one uh, celebrates liberty or death. Um, so very, you know, extreme there, right? Like either you're with us or you're dead. Like it's, it, it's an old um, saying. And actually uh, you see the liberty cap on there. And then this will be interesting for those of you who are familiar with 20th century history. Um, these are drawing on an old Roman symbol, the fasces, which is the, the basis of the word fascist. Um, that idea of fascism doesn't exist yet, but you see this symbol um, in lots of revolutionary things because it's an ancient Roman symbol. And actually, I noticed it down in downtown Denver at Civic Center Park um, and was really concerned and curious, like, when did that come to be? Because if it came to be as part of in like the 1920s and 30s, and I would assume it was a fascist symbol, but it turns out that the park was created before that. Um, okay, next the big thing that happens is on October 5th, um, Parisian women are, are gathered at the Hotel de Ville, so the Paris City Hall, uh, protesting bread prices because they literally cannot feed their children. The bread prices are through the roof, there's shortages. Um, and that protest will eventually turn into a march to Versailles. They decide we need to go to the king and tell the king all of our troubles. There also had been some rumors that the king's guards had been burning and, and defaming uh, cockades. So that was seen as like an affront to the revolution. So they thought if they could just get the king's ear, maybe he could help them. It turns into a pretty violent riot. So first off, they grab some cannons from the Hotel de Ville and carry them to Versailles. It's uh, about a 19 mile march, um, sorry, 12 mile march. And it's gonna lead to quite a lot of violence at Versailles itself too. The king and queen are eventually forced to leave Versailles and they move into the Tuileries Palace in Paris. Now it's France, so there's no shortage of fancy palaces for the king and queen to live in. But if you think about Versailles and the symbolism of that, that was really a symbol of the king's authority. Like the whole palace was built so that the king could control the nobility, so that they had some distance from the radicalism of Paris. So between May of 1789 and October of 1789, we go from like a fairly stable monarchy, even if it's a little bankrupt, to a bunch of women, and these are just regular women of the third estate, marching to Versailles and forcing the king and queen back to Paris. So this is really a, a 
a turn on the king's power. The king is now subject to the people's will. Um, he's escorted, the king and queen are escorted back to Paris by all of these women who had marched, um, except now instead of sort of like, you know, are all fired up because they're going to ask the king for something, they're escorting the king back to Paris. A lot of his guardsmen's heads have been cut off and put on pikes, as you see in the picture here. And by the way, I include the, the translation of the captions here, but it's Google Translate, so it's a little iffy, but um, we'll look at some of these images later. Uh, that's, a, again, a pretty violent turn, right? Um, just to give another example of women kind of taking their claim in this process, um, this is women sitting in the National Assembly amongst the deputies. So women are actively participating, are, are claiming agency for themselves and saying, like, here's the things that we want. And one of the things that we'll read in your article book is one of the petitions that um, women presented to the National Assembly claiming citizenship, saying, like, all of these things apply to us as well. <clears throat> I want to talk about this idea, too, that, you know, we really look at the revolution as this kind of, especially as we go forward, we're going to look at all of the ways in which it's failed, all of the ways in which the violence got out of hand. Um, but I think there's also this exciting moment, 1789, that sometimes gets a little bit underestimated. This is a quote from Robert Darton. He's on your um, vocab list as one of the historians that you need to know. Um, and I just thought this was a really nice quote kind of summing up this idea of this spirit of 89, that it was an energy. He uses the phrase possibilism, that they were really interested in all that was possible, in all of the things that could be. Um, fundamental change in everyday life. And we think of this in sort of the abstract and we're like, okay, whatever, like things change. But no, everything changed. And we'll get into some more details about how that happened um, in the coming weeks. So thanks again for watching and hopefully I will be back soon. Bye.